Well, welcome everybody to our nat or to our <laughs> lunch and learn. We are very excited today that we have a special lunch and learn with our present uh, presenter, Michelle Schwarzalder. And Michelle is a professional organizer and she is the disarray doctor. So we're very excited that Michelle um, is joining us today. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Darlene. Uh, yes, like uh, Darlene said, I work as a professional organizer and I'm very excited to share my passion with you guys today. And um, I hope that you have a big takeaway from this, whether it be an educational takeaway or inspirational. Either way, I hope I have a gift to offer you today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, I work as a professional organizer and I like to say that I began organizing around the age of 12. Uh, I was a little girl and my mom had a reupholstery shop and I loved getting into her shop and organizing all of her buttons and her notions and threads and things of that nature to keep her shop running smoothly. And after I graduated from college, I became a stay-at-home parent for the past 16 years. And I like to say that that was my boot camp uh, to really perfecting my home management and organizational skills. As my kids got older, you can see here in this picture that I have two teenagers now. And as they got older, I was looking for something to do. So I started volunteering at my children's school and organizing in classrooms. I eventually tackled our PTO closet. Then the scouts pulled me in and had me organizing stuff for them. Pretty soon word got around the neighborhood and friends and family were bringing me into their homes. Um, I decided to go professional in 2017, and I joined a group called NAPO, which is the National Association for Productivity and Professional Organizing. And we are a nationwide group of organizers and productivity specialists who support each other, and we are always learning from each other uh, about the latest trends in organization. Um, like I said, I have two teenagers and I have three cats in my household. So we're a tidy little bunch. And I am a huge lover of fitness and food. Enough about me, let's talk about you guys. Uh, right now, we are spending a astronomical amount of time in our homes as you all might be feeling. Uh, we, are, we are learning in our homes, we are working from our homes. We are exercising, we are worshiping, and we are socializing, uh, kind of like right now today. And really, our homes were not designed for this type of occupancy or this type of use. And even for the most seasoned domestic organizers such as myself, um, given the times that we are living in for these past 10 months, uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, right now behind me, it looks really pretty and clean in my home, but I admit that even I have some areas that have been challenging for me. Uh, we all do right now. Why? Why are we disorganized? Well, there are lots and lots of reasons. Life happens. Life is so very busy and we want to honor and uh, hold space for all of the reasons on this list. Uh, why we become disorganized. And being here today is definitely a great step towards uh, taking control of your chaos and your disorganization that we all have in our lives, regardless of the reason. And uh, this little picture of this house here uh, might, might be very relatable to you. Uh, I know a lot of us are feeling very much like this house personally and when we are in our spaces. Today, we're going on a fun little journey, and I want to start with kind of telling you guys a little bit about the positive benefits of living a more organized life to help inspire you. Then we will discuss how to declutter and organize, which is really the nuts and bolts of our conversation today. And then we will touch a little bit on maintenance and long-term, um, long-term, uh, 
stuff. <laughs> so let's get started in with the positive benefits. And I'm going to go through this section a little bit more quickly uh, to get to our nuts and bolts today. Um, I like to say that being organized is not a destination. It's a practice. We don't get organized and then just stay there. Um, it's a practice just like any other practice in life. Uh, you know, fitness, uh, you can't just do this tree pose here that you see this person doing the first time that you try yoga. Um, it does take some practice and some time to get your balance and your strength and your skill. And organizing is very much the same way. It's an everyday practice. One of my favorite reasons to be organized, health benefit, positive benefit, and all over benefit is stress relief. The CDC says that 80% of our medical expenses are stress related. So getting organized is certainly going to cut down on the amount of stress in your life. Another great reason is better sleep. I don't know about you guys, but a messy bedroom will definitely create a feeling of tension and have me feeling quite deflated at the end of the day. I sleep much better in a tidy bedroom. I also eat better when I have a clean and tidy organized kitchen to prepare my foods in. Another positive attribute to being organized is more time for self-care. Statistically speaking, if you get rid of a clutter in your home, you are eliminating 40% of your housework, 40%. That's a big chunk of time. I don't know what you could do with 40% more time, but I can think of a lot of really great ways to spend my day. You're also going to increase your productivity. Another fun little statistic that I like is that we spend one year of our lives searching for lost things, one year. So being organized definitely increases our productivity. It also encourages harmonious relationships with others. If anybody's ever gotten into a little bit of a disagreement with their housemates or their spouse or their children, you might find this a very relatable reason. Leaving less for your family. Um, my mom used to say, nobody gets out of this alive. And she is so very right we all expire eventually. And when we go, what we leave behind becomes other people's responsibilities. So in considering our expiration dates will be upon us at one point in our lives, it's important to consider what we're gonna leave behind for our family, hopefully less and not more. Another great point to living a more organized life is that you're going to make your home easier to navigate for a caregiver or a guest. If you have young children and you're often hiring babysitters, or if you are going to be needing a caretaker, or if you are a caretaker, you might be able to attest to a tidy home uh, being a great place to care for your patients. You can spend a lot more time taking care of them if the house is tidy and clean you can find what you need a lot easier. You're gonna make your home safer. I have heard a lot of stories from the fire department and from first responders that there is a huge issue when it comes to being able to get into someone's home, to um, cart them off in the ambulance when they cannot get to the person and there is no clear pathway. Uh, a lot of times too, lots of clutter can become a very combustible fire hazard. So your home will be a safer place to live if you are organized. Another great point is to actually have that party or family gathering. Has anybody ever wanted or desired to invite their family and friends over, but hesitated to do so because of the condition of your home? So having a tidy house will encourage parties and family gatherings someday, not just yet, but someday. We'll get back to that eventually. And my favorite reason for being more organized is to save money. And here's one of my favorite examples of this. I was organizing with my good friend and we were working in her bedroom and her master bathroom, her closet area. During the cleanup and tidying process, we found 12 pair of glasses in that space, 12 pair of glasses. And she says, well, I can't find them. So I just buy a new pair every time. 
Well, that's $5 a piece, they're, but they're only $5. Well, that's 60 bucks in glasses. And this is just one small space in her house. I can't imagine what we're gonna find in her home office or her living room where she reads and watches TV. Uh, we'll probably come out with about two dozen pair when it's all said and done. Uh, here is, in a nutshell, the positive benefits to living a more organized life. And I offer you, if you would like, to go ahead and take a picture of this screenshot here. I have put little camera icons on some of my slides today to help you take notes. If that's easier for you, you can just take a screenshot of any of my slides that have a little camera icon. Let's move along to the nuts and bolts, getting organized. This is your guide for decluttering and getting organized. I'm gonna jump right in. And the first thing when you decide to tackle some type of an organization project is to define for yourself what organized means. Uh, a good example of what I'm talking about here, when you look at this chart, you might find that you fall somewhere in this category uh, or somewhere on this chart, maybe you are more over here in the chronic disorganized area. You have spaces that are non-functional. Maybe you have some hazards in your home uh, or you have hoarding tendencies or you are an over collector. Then maybe you are right here in the middle. You have spaces that are kind of somewhat functional, a few minor obstacles in your home and certain areas that are just in bad shape but overall your house is looking pretty good. And then we have others here who are in the aesthetic organization realm and they are just seeking a way to obtain that Pinterest perfect, beautiful pantry uh, that we all see in the magazines and on some of those organization shows that are happening right now. So define what organized means to you. If you're over here in this chronic area, and you have a plan to tackle that garage and add all this aesthetic appeal to it in one weekend, that's gonna be a challenging goal. Perhaps if you are chronically disorganized, set yourself up to obtain function and be more towards mild disorganization and take it one step at a time. Again, organized is not a destination, it's a practice. Here are some examples of chronic disorganization. This friend of mine here, you can see this before picture, her door to her back is completely obstructed. The goal here was just to get her functional. Afterwards, she's looking pretty good. To her, this is organized. This is what organized means to her. She's feeling really good about this. She can walk through this garage now. There's no longer any hazards. Although, me personally, I look at that garage and I see that we could still declutter. We could still remove a lot of items. She still has a lot of duplicates and a lot of stuff going on in that space. But to her, this is perfect. This is all she needs. Here's some good examples of mild disorganization. You can see in this garage picture here that the garage is somewhat functional. She's still able to park her car in here. Getting out is a little bit challenging. And of course, this door in the back is blocked. So after just a couple hours, we have unblocked that door. We have created a little bit more room in here. She can get out of her car easily. And now her son can get to his bike. Another example of mild disorganization. I love this picture on the left because you can see over here that her kitchen looks pretty good. But boom, you open up that closet door in the hallway and there's a secret stash in there. A lot of us have those going on in our homes. Easy to shut the door and ignore it. Again, same thing with this closet. She's got a little bit of an obstruction here, but it's not too bad. Here's some aesthetic examples. Um, this pantry doesn't look too bad. Many of us might agree that it's very functional. However, we've gone crazy over here with aesthetic appeal. We've got matching containers and fancy glass canisters with snazzy labels. And this pantry door is just looking absolutely amazing. 
It's absolutely over the top. I love this picture. And when you define organization for you, it can mean both of these things. Uh, you can take some tape and label your containers very simply and easily. That allows function. That is a system that is absolutely organized for this person. Or over here, you can go to Lowe's and buy yourself a $70 fancy schmancy organization container. So think about what organized looks like to you when you set your goals and decide what you wanna see at the end. And again, it's, it's a process, it's a practice. There is no destination when it comes to getting organized. After you have defined what organized means to you, it's time to make a lot of decisions and sort your stuff. And when I say decide and sort, I literally mean we're gonna decide on one item at a time. You're gonna pick it up, you're gonna look at it and you're gonna decide what to do with it. And here are the categories that I like to suggest that people sort into. So we have our keep category. That's the stuff that is gonna remain in the space where we are working. Our relocate category, donate and sell, trash, give to others and take action. Let's break those down a little bit. Again, the keep stuff, if we're working in our kitchen that day, we're organizing our kitchen, we're going through our items, we want to keep the things in our kitchen that stay in that space we're gonna put those into our keep pile. Then as we're going through our kitchen, if we find things like tools that don't belong in our kitchen, those are gonna go, go into the second box here, our relocate. Relocate items are the things that you still want to keep, but that do not belong in the space where you are working. So go ahead and put those oddball things in there to worry about later. Donate and sell. This is where you're going to put any items that you no longer need or want. Our trash pile, that's gonna be for any garbage, recyclables or hazardous waste that you come across during your sorting and decision-making process. The give to others pile. Uh, this is one of my favorite piles to suggest to people. Um, a lot of organizers don't uh, have you think about this, but I like to because my experience has shown me that we have a lot of stuff in our homes that belong to other people. You might be surprised to see that you've borrowed things from others that you forgot to give back to them. And also family heirlooms. Sometimes we have things that aren't going to be donated because they are so special. And we might want to pass these things down to other people in our family to keep them within our family. So that's going to be your other's pile, the stuff that you want to hand down. And then our take action pile. I also love this one. This is where you're going to put anything that you come across that requires action. Uh, for example, library books that might need to go back to the library or a bag of returns that you found that you had forgotten to take to Walmart. Um, another great thing to put here would be uh, like an empty pill container. Say you need to call and refill those, those pills, that prescription, that's going to go into your take action pile. So after you have started sorting and deciding, you might find that it's really challenging to make decisions. Um, you might mill around a lot and not really know what to do with certain items. Do you keep it? Do you let it go? Is it sellable? What do you do with it? Um, here's some questions that I love to ask with my clients and with myself when we're organizing together. Uh, do I use it? If so, have I used it in the last year? Uh, now, this question is a good one, but it also can um, lead us astray sometimes. Uh, for example, if you have an item sitting in your garage that you haven't used in a year, um, it might be okay to let go of it. But sometimes, say you've been sick for a while, you haven't been mowing your lawn. That lawnmower has been sitting out there for a year. You've hired a lawn company to come in and service your lawn for a while. But the intention is to resume mowing your own lawn once you're well. In a situation like that, having something that you've kept for a year and not used might not make sense to part with it. But clothing and gifts and personal items of that nature, if you haven't touched it or used it in a year, it's pretty safe to say that you can let go of it. 
Is this item a duplicate? Well, my friend with the 12 pair of glasses uh, is a very great example of this. Granted, there are times that we do want to have duplicate items. For example, I have two pair of eyeglasses. I keep a spare pair in case this pair was to break. I think that that's reasonable, but 12 pair is a little bit over the top. That's where you might wanna think about paring down and letting go. How does this item make me feel? This is a great question. A lot of people, as soon as they touch something, they say, oh my gosh, this was from my, my previous marriage or an ex-boyfriend, I can let this go. Then again, on the other end of the spectrum, oh, this is so great, I love this. It reminds me of one of the most joyful times in my life. That might be an item that you would like to keep. Something that doesn't make you feel good, let it go. It's okay to do that. You're gonna free up a lot of space in your heart and in your soul to really love the items that do bring you joy. This is one of my favorite questions. Am I keeping this item out of obligation? I can't tell you how many times I have heard scenarios like this, where we receive a gift that maybe doesn't suit our taste and we feel very obligated to keep this item. Um, another great example of obligation is when we have a loved one who has passed away and we're hanging on to their things, uh, kind of in a, in a way to hang on to them. Uh, it feels good to keep their things close to us. And I actually had a, a client who was really, really struggling with this massive set of old china that belonged to her mom. And it was taking up space in her garage. She didn't use it. She didn't even have a formal dining room. No one in her family wanted this china set. She felt obligated to keep it. And I told her, I said, you know, this is ultimately a decision that you need to make. She wrestled with it for a very long time and ended up going and speaking with her mental health care provider about it. And he had her run through this really interesting um, scenario that I would like to share with you guys today. He, he had her close her eyes and imagine that she was speaking to her mom who had passed on. And she says, you know, mom, I love you. I love your memory. I wanna cherish you, but these dishes are a burden to me and I don't use them and I feel very obligated to keep them. Um, what do you think that mom would say to her daughter knowing that it was a burden and an obligation? And my client opened her eyes after that imaginary conversation and she knew that it was time to let those dishes go because her mom would not want her to feel burdened or obligated. Is this item broken or worth repairing? This is a great one too. Um, I had a friend who was pretty adamant about hanging on to an old uh, wooden tray that was very fancy and it was broken and she wanted to repair it. Uh, in order to repair this tray, she was gonna need to go and purchase some clamps and some wood glue and then take the time to make the repairs. So I got on to Amazon and I was able to find a tray very similar to the one that she had for $20. At that time, she says, well, it's really not even worth the $20 to go buy the glue and the clamps and to sit down and fix it. We decided to toss that tray and she treated herself to a brand new one. Another good question, does this item align with my current lifestyle and goals? This is a great question for anyone who is in a life transition, especially like a retirement type scenario. Um, one of my good friends had a closet full of pantsuits and blazers, but she was retired. That wasn't her uniform anymore. She was able to take away a lot of clothing out of her closet and make space for her new uniform of yoga pants and comfy stretchy things to wear daily. Another good question to consider, do I need to save this for legal reasons? Uh, my experience has shown me that most people hang on to paperwork and documents much longer than they actually need to. Uh, Kiplinger.com is a great website that I refer people to often. They have a really tidy little place on their website with all of the documents that you might keep in your cupboards and the amount of time that you should keep them and what you should do with them. Also, I encourage you to um, dispose of these items responsibly by having them shredded. That's very, very important to do. 
So here's a nice screenshot for you if you guys want to take a picture of these questions that you might contemplate with yourself while you are sorting and deciding on the items in your home. Moving along, after you have defined, organized, made some decisions and started sorting out your items, it's going to be time to organize the keep items. And that is all the stuff in this box here. We're not gonna worry about the other five boxes just yet. We're gonna focus on that kitchen that we're working on and the items that stay in that kitchen. And we're gonna organize them. For our keep box, as we go through things, I want you to try to, if you can, categorize like with like or pair together items that are often used together. For example, in a kitchen, a lot of times people like to take all of the things that they would use for baking and keep those together in a container and store it in that way. Um, after you have categorized and tried to pair your like stuff together, contain your items. Um, and I will show you some pictures of all of these suggestions here in just a minute. Um, when we contain, let's get creative. We do not need to have a big fancy schmancy budget and go to the container store and buy all these great things to be organized. We just don't, um, especially right now with Amazon packages being delivered to our doors daily. Right there, you have free organizational tools at your doorstep. Use boxes, use shoe boxes, use baskets, bags, and containers that are used. Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace, is a really great place to go to find used containers. You do not have to have a super huge budget. Um, your designate or your keep stuff needs a designated location. When you're thinking about where you want to relocate the items in your home or store the items in your home, consider how often you use them. When uh, you use something every day, you might want to consider keeping it pretty handy front and center. Something that you use weekly, not so much. Something that you use twice a year, that can be kept way, way up high, somewhere out of reach, uh, not, not a convenient location. You don't need to consider a convenient location for that. Also think about how you use an item. Uh, I have some really good examples of designated locations based on their use coming up in some pictures here. Another thing I love to suggest with our keep stuff is to add labels. Adding labels can really help us to define our spaces and get used to where we're storing our things. And it will also help others in our home to find what they need. It will encourage people in our home to be able to put things away after they have used them. It will keep your system really functional, really tidy, and it'll keep your spaces a lot cleaner if you label so that it's definitely easy to find and put things away. So here are some examples of what we were just talking about. Uh, some great contain and categorizing going on right here with all of these Nerf bullets. They're all together. They're all alike. They're all Nerf related, even though they don't look the same. And they are in one nice snazzy container. Over here on the left side, we have a picture of art supplies. Now, this is a great example of containing like items together. It's not all the same, but they all relate. When my daughter goes to do her painting project, she's going to need her paint, she's going to need her brushes, and she's going to need this little tray back here to put her paint in. So we contain all of those things together so it's easy for her to find. Another categorize and contain example. This ribbon here on the left, very easy to tell what it is, looks great, all the same, simple and easy. This rope and string over here on the right side. It's all the same, it's all similar, it's all relatable. Very easy to see what that is. Personally, I think I would make that string look a little bit tidier, but again, this person has defined organization as all of it just being together. It doesn't have to look pretty to them. This works, it's a great system. Here's some good examples of categorizing, containing, and designating a location. 
These items here are located in the bottom drawer, the, the Tupperware here. It's in the bottom drawer. They don't go for this very often. It doesn't need to be right at arm's reach and it fits nicely into the container, which is the drawer. The drawer is actually a container. It's all categorized and the location has been very well thought out. I love how all of the lids are together over here in this basket. And I can tell you when I did this job, when we organized this space right here, we made sure that every single one of those Tupperware containers had a matching lid. And if they didn't, we tossed them. We didn't keep those. Over here on the right hand side, you can see that these things are categorized. She's got all her measuring cups together. Her measuring spoons are together. Uh, this looks like some wine corking equipment over here. Again, all of her containers uh, don't match. But who cares? It, it works. This works. I think these were probably used. She bought them on Marketplace. She could have used cardboard shoe boxes in place of all those fancy plastic parts, but it works really well. And then this drawer here was a top upper drawer. She wanted all of these items to be very close at hand, right within her reach anytime that she was working in her kitchen. Some other good examples of categorize and designate a location. This is also a good example of when we don't use containers. There's no containing going on here, no containers at all. Um, this kitchen picture actually is my kitchen. And I like to share pictures of my house when I am giving uh, presentations like this because people often ask me, well, how do you live? What does your space look like? So I keep my dishes right up above my dishwasher. I keep all of my glassware in this cabinet right here to the right of my dishes. And the reason for that is the, des the designated location is very convenient. I can take my dishes out, put them up into my cupboard very quickly and easily. Same thing with my glasses makes me very efficient. Over here in this garage picture, we gave a lot of consideration to the placement of these bicycles. This family uses their bicycles almost daily. They wanted those to be very easy to get at. They wanted to be able to get them out of the garage quickly. On the other hand, this snow blower, that's more something that's seasonal. It's not used very often. And the person that lives in this house was willing to pull their car out of the garage to access that snowblower when needed. That is going to be a better solution than pulling that car out every day to access those bicycles. So consider where you're putting your items and how often you use them. Another great example of categorize, contain, and label. You can see over here on the left, this before picture, the cabinet is just chaotic and crazy. Can't really tell what's in there. So we have contained everything, we have categorized everything, and then we have labeled everything. Very easy to find the items that she needs now, very little searching required, and she's going to know when it's time to restock on any given item that she may be out of. Let's zoom in on these labels. As you can see, they are not fancy schmancy. They are not Pinterest perfect. Uh, they don't cost a lot of money because these are post-it notes. Post-it notes, that's all they are. It's just post-it notes taped onto these boxes with packaging tape. You do not have to get fancy schmancy. You don't have to have a label maker or a uh, cricket to print out those really elaborate labels. You just don't, unless you want to, of course. This is my closet. Again, I said I like to share pictures of the way that I live and how I stay organized. I don't have a fancy schmancy closet system. I don't have a lot of built-ins in here. On the left side, this black bookshelf is just that. It's a bookshelf. I repurposed it because I no longer needed it as a bookshelf. And my closet was designed in the 1940s. My entire house was designed in the 1940s. And when I moved in here a year ago, the most recent updates were done in the late 80s and early 90s. And this picture over here on the right hand side, the wire shelf up at the top are the newest updates that my very old closet has. 
you don't need to have a fancy system to be organized. You can repurpose an old bookshelf as I have done here and make do with what you've got. Um, I love to share this top picture up here of my dresser drawer. I mentioned earlier that I love to work out and I'm a fan of fitness. And some people might say, gosh, that's a lot of t-shirts that you've got in that drawer. And it is, it is a lot of t-shirts. Um, but being organized doesn't necessarily mean being a minimalist. I have a lot of shoes. I have a lot of clothes. I do. I think that I probably have more than I need, um, but I don't share this space with anybody else. It's all mine. And when I get in my closet, I feel organized. I can find what I need. It's efficient and it works for me. So don't feel for a minute that being organized means that you have to get rid of all your stuff because you don't. If you have the space to contain it and manage it in a way that works for you, that's efficient, that counts. That's all you need. Moving along. I hope that's helpful for you on organizing your keep items. I hope that's given you some good clues and um, guidance on how you might do that for yourself. After we've organized our keep items, we're gonna talk about those relocate items here in this box. This is a really important step in the organization process, um, but I can tell you that a lot of times it can feel like adding fuel to the fire, especially if your house is all over in disarray. If every single room in your house is exploding at the seams, you're gonna go and take those tools that we found in the kitchen earlier, and you're gonna go relocate them to the space where they might go. Say that's your garage. You go into that garage, it is a whirlwind in there. Adding these tools back to that mess might seem counterproductive. It might feel like you're adding fuel to your fire. And it might feel a little bit frustrating at first, but I guarantee you, as you go along through different spaces in your home and you start paring down and reducing and relocating, it will come together and it will start to make sense. And you will find that there is space for all of your things and that there can be destinations where things belong. And it'll start to feel comfortable and natural as you move things around your house and relocate your items. After you've relocated, the next step, and this is, in my opinion, the biggest step in organization, the deacquisition phase. And deacquisition basically means getting rid of the stuff that you have, getting rid of, of the extras, getting rid of what you don't want and what you've acquired. A lot of people think, oh, well, organizing is the biggest part of getting organized. Really, it's not. This deacquisition phase is in my opinion, the most important part to being organized. When we deacquisition, we are tackling these four boxes. That's why it's such a huge step and it is so important. If we don't deacquisition and get rid of these donate cell items and take out the trash and give the things to others that belong to them and take some action, we're gonna end up right back where we started with chaos and disorganization creeping in again. I can't emphasize how much the deacquisition phase is important. So for our deacquisitioning, we're going to start with that donate cell box. Um, a lot of people have massive quantities of things that they want to get rid of. Sometimes it won't fit into their vehicle or they just simply aren't capable of getting these items to the donation places. But don't worry, there is free pickup available. Uh, the National Kidney Foundation is great. They will come and grab things for you. Volunteers of America, same thing. And the Furniture Bank of Central Ohio. Aside from just furniture, they do also take household goods. Um, any kind of uh, recommendations or suggestions that I give you today, this is my short list. Uh, there are so many other possibilities. I would encourage you uh, to research many other options aside from just the few that I'm going to mention today. Another great way to get rid of your stuff is to post it on freecycle.com. And curbside, putting stuff out on your curb for others to uh, pick through if they would like is also a great way to let go of items. Um, be sure to check with your municipalities to make sure that that's legal 
in your area. Some people aren't allowed to set things out curbside like that. Um, another great way to get rid of your donate sell items is to consider consigning. If you have a uh, high-end clothing, consignment shops are a great place to take your stuff to put a little bit of money back in your pocket. Clothes Mentor is one of my favorites. Used electronics and equipment stores. Those are a great place to take any duplicate items that you have as far as electronics and equipments go. Um, even if it's outdated, it still can be very, very usable for a lot of people out there who don't have access to great technology. Never hesitate to ask if those things are viable. New Uses is a great store to consider for reselling your items of that nature. And then, of course, we have our buy, sell, trade sites. These are a great place to list your things for sale or even for free. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, I love it. It works very, very well for me and for my friends. eBay is a wonderful place. Craigslist is a wonderful place. And public auction is also a good way to part with uh, large quantities. Maybe if you have collections, a great way to sell your stuff and put some money back in your pocket. Our trash pile, you might think it's as simple as just taking the trash out to the curb. Really, it's not. Um, you might be surprised to see how much stuff you have in your home that would be considered trash. Um, bulk pickup might be necessary if you have a lot of garbage that you need to get rid of. And also curbside pickup is a great option, especially here in Worthington. They do have bulk curbside pickup. Not all municipalities have that. I feel very grateful that I have access to that. Sometimes dumpster rentals might be necessary if you do not have bulk curbside pickup. Junk removal services. I can't tell you how much I love these guys. They are so fantastic because they're kind of like a one-stop shop and they're very environmentally um, conscious when they um, get rid of all of their things. They will pick up anything that's garbage, anything that's a donation, anything that can be reused. They're a one-stop shop and they will um, uh, get rid of those things in the most responsible way that they can by donating donatable items. They will uh, get rid of the organic matter in a really responsible way and then hazardous waste they take it very seriously and dispose of that really well too. Um, local recycling facilities. A lot of us aren't aware that Columbus has over 200 public drop-off recycling facilities around our city and typically you'll find these located at uh, rec centers or uh, fire stations, sometimes at schools or public libraries. And you can go to columbus.gov and search where facilities are located in your neighborhood. And this is great for taking cardboard and any kind of recycling that is overflowing in your home. Uh, Swaco is definitely the place to go with your hazardous waste. They will take paints, chemicals, tires, batteries, fuels. Uh, they do charge for a lot of those items. It's not a lot. Uh, sometimes you can drop things off for free at Swayco. I would encourage you to give a call to them or check out their website if you have any questions about what they take or what it might cost. Our give to others box. This is a fun one. Uh, we are going to consider these items that we have in here and who we might be giving them to. And we're going to reach out to those people and we're going to connect and we're going to plan to get these items back to the people that they belong to. Call up that friend that you haven't seen in a while. Hey, Mary, I'm going to be in your edge of town on Wednesday. I would love to drop off that crock pot that I've had for the last four months. Make time to do that. I know right now we can't socialize the way we would like to, but even connecting and making a plan to drop items off on somebody's front porch is gonna get that stuff off of your list and out of your space. Um, if it's somebody who lives out of state, you might consider shipping those items to them right now. So make that plan, make that connection and get those items to the people you would like to give them to. Um, it is important to remember 
that when you think to yourself, oh, Aunt so-and-so would love Grandma's China collection. Well, maybe Aunt so-and-so wouldn't like Grandma's China collection. And that is okay. Um, I would encourage you not to not to burden your loved ones with items that they don't want. Um, try not to make others feel obligated to take those things. They are not always important to others in our family as they are to you. Um, putting that burden of obligation on others takes us right back to where you might be with feeling obligated to keep items as well. If they don't want them, ask somebody else in the family. If nobody wants those items, it's okay to let it go. Hard to do, yes, but it's okay to let those items go. Our take action box. This is where we've put all that stuff that we have to do. So I want you to take the time to schedule repairs. Call up all of those people that you need to get into the house to do any home repairs. Uh, make the arrangements for any vehicle repairs that you have going on. Sit down, make those phone calls, get that stuff on your list to tackle it. Plan a day for running errands. This is really important. I've seen a lot of people who have these beautifully organized spaces and they've taken all that action stuff and put it in the car and driven around with it for months. If that's you, that's okay. We can all relate to that. Even I am guilty of doing that myself. So make sure that you plan a day for those errands. Um, sometimes it's hard to get out and run errands for people, especially right now, or if you're not well, or if you're uh, busy, they have errand running services and concierjod.com is a great place you might consider to get your errands done. And also, I love to suggest that people employ family members, friends, or neighbors to run errands for them. Uh, sometimes our teenagers are really excited about earning a little extra cash and they will get that done for you much cheaper than an errand running service. So plan the time to take action on those things that you need to get done. In a nutshell, that is your guide for getting organized. If anybody wants to take a quick snapshot of that, go right ahead. I don't wanna hold us up on time here too badly. So this next section for maintaining for long-term results, we're gonna cruise through a little bit more quickly so we can open the floor for questions. Uh, maintaining is very, very important and decluttering regularly falls at the top of our list. Um, decluttering is so important. It's something that should be done in your home daily and weekly and monthly and annually, seasonally. Uh, we, we never stop decluttering. Again, uh, being organized is not a destination, it's a practice. Uh, my children and I have a habit every night. We do our dinner dishes and we take five minutes to go through the house and collect the things that are out of place. We put away our electronics, we plug in our cell phones where they belong, we throw away the garbage, we hang up the coats, we put the backpacks where they belong and we pick up our shoes, whatnot. We declutter regularly. It becomes a very quick and easy process when you do it often. Have a one in one out policy. I love this policy, especially for clothing and for children's toys. Remember the picture I showed you earlier of my closet with all of my tennis shoes that I wear to the gym? I don't have any room to spare in there. If I buy myself a new pair of tennis shoes, I have to get rid of a pair. I have no more space to store anymore. I cannot have an excess. Buy a new pair of tennis shoes, a pair is going out the door. With that being said, our one in one out policy, when those things are going out, create yourself a donation station. Whether it's a container in your garage or a space in the trunk of your car, whatever it is, have a place to put those donated items so that they have a purpose and a destination and they don't become clutter. 
keep a to-do list. This is my absolute favorite suggestion. I love my to-do list. I cannot live without my to-do list. I can't breathe without my to-do list. I call my to-do list my roadmap for staying organized. Um, I have an app on my phone and I love it. It's called Evernote and I can sync it with my computer. I have my phone with me at all times. I can add to my to-do list anywhere at any time. My to-do list is constantly rotating. I'm constantly adding things to it daily. I'm constantly tackling things on that list daily. So keep yourself a to-do list. It's a very great way to categorize and remember, instead of clogging up your brain, what you need to do to get things moving along. Reevaluate. After it's all said and done, reevaluate your spaces every year, maybe twice a year. Go through the areas that you have organized, such as your kids' bedrooms. That's a great place that needs reevaluating often. Our children outgrow the needs that they once had, their interests change, their hobbies change. It's very important to go back in and reevaluate our spaces, our closets our cupboards, our areas, make sure that those systems are working. And if we have anything we no longer need, get rid of it, run through that list again of how to deacquisition and reevaluate continuously to maintain for long-term results. In a nutshell, there are your pieces of advice for maintaining if you wanna take a snapshot of that. And here I have uh, collected all of the lovely suggestions on my short list uh, that we discussed through the presentation today. Um, we have just a few more minutes until the top of the hour. And now is a great time to answer any questions that anybody might have. Hello, I'm Nancy. Hi, Nancy. I got a question. I um I am one of those people that with your picture, I'm like one of those people that do better with kind of a disorganized basket versus an organized basket. And in fact, a friend of mine suggested the basket method, which she uses, and it works really well for me. So I have a basket of things with paints in it, and uh and my my uh, stamps for when I'm doing um mail so and it works really great what what i have trouble with is things that don't necessarily like i don't know where they belong and i just downsized so a lot of the stuff you talked about i i did and it was very very hard very hard um but i'm still a wash in boxes and i just don't know where to i mean i i feel like i'm moving things from one box to another box and not dealing with it Absolutely. Can you give me an example of an item that you have that you can't define or decide where to, where to put it? Okay. Well, for example, you know, uh, I have a, a, a larger kitchen here than I had at the other place. So I actually had more space to put stuff, but now I'm finding duplicates of stuff that I already put away. And it's like, okay, how many, loaves of bread am I going to make at one time? And when's the last time I made bread? It was like, you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> exactly, right. Well, in a situation like that, where you keep finding duplicates, you'll want to start collecting all of those duplicates together. Like, uh, for example, I don't know if maybe you're speaking of a bread machine to make your bread with, uh, or uh, supplies that you this might use school. baking. Yeah, this was old school. <laughs> okay, so a, a large collection of baking supplies. Um, I would start collecting all of those things together in one spot, kind of like uh, the relocation process. You're gonna put anything that you find that's baking oriented all together in one area. And then you will go through that large collection and pare down what you don't need. Um, if you have duplicate uh, things, choose the better of those things and get rid of the rest. Um, it would take time to maybe unpack all those boxes and you might continue, as you said, uh, to find duplicate items. Um, but just keep going through the process of 
letting go of the extra things that you don't need. Um, just keep going through the process over and over. It's kind of like an onion. There's many layers and we peel layers off one at a time. Okay, that's helpful. Thank I you so that's much. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a couple of things. Um, uh, first, uh, thank you. And um, I've done some small things during all this time, the last 10 months, little things like a linen closet or something, but boy, is the motivation lagging at this point. But um, two questions. First of all, what was the name of the app that was the to-do list you keep? Yeah, you said the Evernote. Ever know it's the, yeah, it's listed down here on the screen that we're looking at now under resources. Oh, there it is. That okay. You, yeah, to see how to spell it. Um, it's wonderful. I love okay. it. Okay. And, and it's free. Second, oh, good. <laughs> um, last, um, do you have any tips? My problem with getting rid of some things is the sentimental attachment to it. That seems to be a big roadblock for me a lot of times, especially when it comes yeah. to some of my kids' things or, you know, so that, any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, with kids' artwork, I have a really great, uh, I know a lady who will take um, stack and stacks of artwork. She can take a hundred pieces of kids' artwork and condense them down and make one piece of artwork from them. It's a great way to keep your sentimental memorabilia and condense it down into one tidy little uh, piece of art. That's just one small example. Um, another great thing to do with memorabilia that's physical um, like you have items that were theirs when they were babies or things like that. Um, sometimes I encourage people to take pictures of these items and hold on to those pictures or keep those pictures as the uh, reminder of those memories and those items. And then you can maybe have a little bit more comfort and ease in letting go of that actual physical item. Um, another thing to do too with stuff like that is maybe to decide what of the memorabilia you want to keep. Allow yourself to have a small stash of memorabilia and things that you do keep that are tangible. And then maybe take pictures of the rest of the items and you have them all together in a much smaller container or in a less uh, occupying space and maybe take the items that you are willing to part with and ask if your children want them. Uh, that's a good thing to do. Although I can tell you from experience, nine times out of 10, the kids don't want their stuff. Um, but yeah, it, there's a lot of, of great ways to treasure our memorabilia without actually hanging on to the items. I hope that's yeah. helpful. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Well, Michelle, if um, nobody else has any other questions, um, I have two things. One, I wanna say thank you so very much for sharing your expertise with us today. And two, um, we are recording this and we will have this up on our website. And three, 